today you'll be hearing a lot from a lot of people with a PhD, but uh, April and I have a PHE, so we're the parents having experience. Um, we'll give you a short back. I'm going to give you a quick short short background of NoFASD uh, Australia and the services we offer, just so that you know. And then uh, just a little bit of a run through of, of why diagnosis is important from a parent's perspective. But April, uh, importantly, is going to really illustrate our presentation by sharing uh, her lived experience. So NoFASD Australia uh, really ensures the, the voice and concerns of the parents and carers of children and adults who have FASD are represented and included where they need to be. They're really at the heart of everything NoFASD Australia does. It's families, parents and carers are at the heart of, of everything that, that we do. Um, we offer a helpline advisory and referral service for those who have FASD or are supporting someone who has FASD. Uh, a regular uh, newsletter providing the latest information on all aspects of FASD for all relevant stakeholders. So this, our newsletter has information for uh, not just parents and carers but for service providers as well. We have community and digital education and training services to increase sector and community knowledge and further FASD awareness. And we provide a, an up-to-date comprehensive website of all curated resources and links to assist in all as aspects of FASD. So why diagnose? Um, diagnosis really gives visibility. Um, and visibility leads to solutions. It opens the door to understanding the child and meeting their needs and certainly Diagnosis made a big difference to me when we finally found out, which wasn't until uh, our daughter was about 17. And I don't know one parent that hasn't found the diagnosis really helpful for them to understand their child. It leads to acceptance, and acceptance is one of the biggest milestones in dealing with FASD. It provides understanding that the child has brain difference and their behaviours, if you've got brain difference, it means then that their behaviours become normal for them. Diagnosis paves the way for trying different parenting approaches and to see the child as maybe someone who can't do rather than won't do and that that's, makes a huge difference to the way then you're going to treat behaviours. It enables parents and carers to build on the child's strengths and set realistic expectations. Expectations that set the child up for success rather than failure. And until our daughter had that diagnosis, she was set up for failure over and over again by expectations, especially in the school system, that expected her because she presented really well, didn't look like she had a disability. There were huge expectations that she could behave in a way that she was really unable to. And it provides knowledge that enables parents to be stronger advocates for their child and help them to, to obtain uh, more appropriate support and services and, and parent advocacy still is, is um, really necessary to, to get your child what they, what they need and even with our daughter as an adult I'm still having to advocate strongly, to, especially now with the NDIS, to get them to understand what she actually needs to be able to live the life and be the best she can be. Well, I'll introduce you to my <coughs> Uh, family, uh, my sister's two grandchildren, Isaiah and Alicia, and my brother's two daughters, Samantha and Kiara. Currently, I, I only have two of those uh, with me at the moment, and I'm going through a process of um, trying to get Isaiah back, who's the child with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. He was removed uh, from my care just a few months ago due to his um, physical violence and aggression towards all of our family. The question's been asked about why to diagnose and, I, and I'll really strongly emphasise it's about the support, both physical, financial and emotional. Um, <clears throat> it's also about the bigger picture stuff where all of you people play such a big role in that support um, situation something that I haven't had either. Um, there's no coordination, there's no connection, and I've had to live through this um, ever since Isaiah started uh, having lots and lots of different issues from very early on. Um, and that started with hearing, so he had um, fluctuating conductive hearing loss, they say since birth, so he's had lots and lots of grommets, so hearing has impacted on his language. 
his learning, his development. So Isaiah's currently 13 and a half. He has all of these issues. Uh, some of those are recent diagnoses, as you can see. Um, huge lot of learning for me when I got when we got the diagnosis, the social worker was a part of that conversation and I had to wait for the department to um, agree to allow that diagnosis to occur. Um, I think that's a significant point to take on. Um, it explains, having the diagnosis and these other things um, identified, explains everything that I see and I experience and that he does and what our family goes through and that's the importance of diagnosis for me. This is some of the, um, the learning that I've had to go through, um, some of the violence, the physical stuff that occurs in my home. Um, the next picture is his bedroom. Um, when I retired from work, he, he's, he's slept with me most of his life. He wouldn't have it any other way. It was a big struggle. So I brought all these wonderful pieces of furniture and set his room up to try and make it enticing for him to be able to sleep independently. It never ever happened. This was the last bedroom that he had that I'd set up and I thought that would be the best thing that would help him, but it didn't. And I met Sue for the first time. Sue came out to my home and met Isaiah and I. We sat talked for hours. And my journey started from there. And now I'm at a point where I'm helping to help others, I hope, and, but in the long run, it's about my boy. And helping everyone that comes into contact with him on a daily basis understand and to make his life easier. Apart from all of that stuff that we deal with, the physical violence, the aggression, the hardships, there's also the beautiful side of this kid. He has this very loving, wonderful uh, side of him as well. Okay, so our daughter's now nearly 40. Um, she's living, I say independently, but it's not independently. It's with a lot of support, um, but it's nowhere near enough support. Um, but we aren't able to have her still under our roof because she's making choices for her life because she's an adult and they, we have her daughter who she's unable to care for, who's uh, nearly 10. For our daughter to live where she does, she has two hours of support a day. Um, she has to have someone manage her money, so she's under guardianship for financial um, services. So her money's totally managed by the public trustee who pay all of her bills, all of her expenses, and then she gets discretionary funds to spend on what she wants to. Unfortunately, she has um, dependency issues, alcohol dependency issues. If she didn't have those alcohol dependency issues herself, uh, she would be doing way better than she does. When she's not drinking, uh, and with two hours of support a day, she does quite well, but she's incredibly lonely. She tends to find it difficult to find the right people to mix with. Uh, so the friends she has often have just as many issues as she has herself, and they, they all get themselves into, into a lot of trouble. So when she goes to see service providers, she can come across really well, but the minute she goes out of the door, whatever happened in that situation is gone and she's on to the next thing. She lives right in the moment. She can't draw on past experiences. She can't project ahead to see what her choices might lead to. So that's very difficult for people to understand, especially service providers who then don't want to hear from me because um, she's an adult and should be able to speak for herself. It's, it's, it's a difficult, difficult situation. And that's where upskilling of everybody that's likely to come across these uh, young people, children and young people, is really important because if, there's no, if they've had no background in FASD, they tend not to believe that that's actually what the case is. And so upskilling of everybody in FASD uh, that's all the service providers, all the health professionals is just so important if we don't want to set these people up for failure and we want them to have the best life possible that they can.